I'm Alban Omeli. I'm a member of the Scientists of Tomorrow from the European Society of Cardiology. Today I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you at the Cardiovascular Research on Life interview with Professor Mack. Good afternoon, Professor Mack. Good afternoon. So thank you for sharing your thought with us today. So we're going to start with the first question. What are the uh, key mitochondrial parameters that we can experimentally measure in cardiomyocyte? Yeah, before we discuss this, I would like to point out that, of course, one can always measure mitochondrial function on isolated organelles, on the isolated mitochondria. However, we know today that mitochondrial function is very tightly controlled by everything that's going on in the cytosol around it. And that is why we actually try to measure these parameters in working cardiac myocytes, just to get a more physiological approach to the whole thing. So in mitochondria, the Krebs cycle is a key uh, regulatory mechanism that produces NADH as an electron donor for the electron transport change. Uh, and that is already the first parameter that we can measure, the NADH autofluorescence. And uh, as a second um, product of the Krebs cycle, we have FADH, which is also delivering electrons to the respiratory chain. And that is the second thing that we can measure. So once the electron transport chain uh, establishes a proton gradient, we can measure a mitochondrial membrane potential. That would be the second important parameter for mitochondrial function. And uh, then we have to consider that the Krebs cycle is regulated by calcium. And therefore, it is quite important to measure the fluxes of calcium into the mitochondria and out, and how the net concentrations change over the course of several different conditions. And finally, we have learned that a mismatch on the mitochondrial level between calcium and ADP, which controls respiration, mm -hmm. can lead to a net oxidation of the redox state, and this can lead to oxidative stress and thereby the emission of reactive oxygen species or ROS from the mitochondria. So that would be the fourth important parameter one can measure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the second question will be how do we measure these parameters? So going back to the NADH and FADH2, uh, this is actually a very nice thing because uh, these um, uh, uh, have a autofluorescence so that we do not need any extra dyes or anything, but we can just excite the myocytes at 340 nanometers and uh, measure the emission of the light at 450 nanometers, that is for NADH, and for FAD, the excitation is at uh, 485 and the emission at 525 nanometers. And the nice thing is we can do this in the very same cell and um, upon oxidation the fluorescence of NADH will decrease and of FAD it will increase. And this means that we can use both parameters ratiometrically which allows us to get rid of movement artifacts and it gives us a very sensitive and very well reproducible uh, inert uh, parameter of mitochondrial redox state. Second is the mitochondrial memory potential. This is actually uh, easier to follow because we can use a fluorescent dye which is called TMRM or TMRE and there is also a, a dye called JC1. We use TMRE and TMRM and this is excited at 540 nanometers and the light emission collected at 605 nanometers. And um, this gives a very bright fluorescence, so it's easy to detect it. Uh, but it's also a very stable parameter, as we can see. So there are a few conditions that really uh, change the mitochondrial memory potential because it's, it's very well, well controlled by many things. The third aspect, calcium, is probably the most challenging thing to do because uh, um, it is difficult to locate calcium indicators specifically into the mitochondria. Uh, we have developed uh, a technique during my time as a postdoc at Johns Hopkins with Brian O'Rourke, uh, a technique with which we uh, load the cardiac myocytes with ROD2 AM, which due to its positive charge locates primarily to the mitochondria, but it can always leave traces in the cytosol and therefore we uh, patch clamp the myocytes and dialyze the cytosol mm -hmm. to get the cytosolic traces of ROD2 out. And at the same time, we put Indo as a salt in the pipette solution and wash this into the cytosol. So we end up with two different dyes 
in two different compartments, namely ROT2 in the mitochondria and INDO1 in the cytosol. And then we can go through all sorts of protocols and measure the changes of mitochondrial and cytosolic calcium in the same cell. The downside of ROT2 is that it's not ratiometric, so it's difficult to calibrate it. Uh, therefore, there are also other uh, genetically encoded calcium probes that can be targeted to mitochondria, which can also be uh, better calibrated and therefore quantitative estimations are easier with this. The downside of this is that you need to uh, incubate cells with the virus for one or two days and this can lead to dedifferentiation of the cardiac myocytes to some extent, which means that also the T-tubular structure can become impaired and therefore also the processes of excitation contraction could be changed slightly. So, so there is always a, an up and down of, of each technique, but these are probably the most uh, commonly used techniques for calcium. Uh, and finally, reactive oxygen species. Uh, we have uh, several fluorescent dyes that we can use. For instance, DCF is often used. Um, um, it is limited by the fact that it can undergo auto-oxidation and it's not very specific for H2O2 but also for hydroxyl radicals and peroxynitrite. However, in our hands we also calibrate this, um, uh, this fluorescent dye at the end of each experiment. And therefore, you still can get valuable information out of it. But you, it's important to keep the excitation energy as low as possible because uh, that would avoid, avoid the auto-oxidation. And uh, a second dye is uh, a little bit more specific, which is called mitosox. Uh, this one will give you superoxide more specifically. Um, and um, then we just now have also a genetically, I mean, there are several genetic, genetically uh, encoded uh, ROS reporters as well. Uh, we are starting to use uh, one that is called ROGFP ORB1. And uh, by uh, 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 Leticia Roma, who is established this mouse in Tobias Dick's lab and who is working with me, uh, we have now a mouse that is stably expressing this reporter either in the mitochondria or the cytosol and this reporter is quite specific and quite sensitive for H2O2 and, and therefore we hope that with this new reporter we can uh, make many new important observations now. So these are the, the four main parameters and the four most important techniques to use but of course there are many more that I just don't have the time to mention now all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we target mitochondria? Uh, for prevention or treatment of heart failure? Yes, there are, there are um, actually approaches ongoing to do this. So maybe the most advanced one right now is a compound uh, that is generically called SS31. It's a cetoschiller peptide. It's a four amino acid uh, peptide which also um, accum which accumulates in the mitochondria and it is known that it binds to cardiolipin. <coughs> and cardiolipin is a phospholipid in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And the idea right now is that SS31 or elamipretide, which is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the name under which it is actually under clinical investigation, um, uh, is by binding to cardiolipin, it is thought to, to protect cardiolipin from oxidative damage and cardiolipin in turn is important to glue the complexes of the respiratory chain together. So the idea is that with this compound uh, the function of the respiratory chain per se which is deteriorated in, in various cardiovascular diseases by oxidative and other damages uh, is kind of fixed and therefore electron flow along the respiratory chain um, in more intact and this would also avoid an excessive emission or production of reactive oxygen species in the first place. The compound is not a direct antioxidant, but it's, as I said, protecting cardiolipin from oxidative damage and therefore has secondary effects reducing oxidative stress. And this compound, uh, elamipretide, is uh, currently in clinical tri phase two trials in patients with systolic and also diastolic heart failure, uh, and we are really keenly. Uh, expecting the results uh, uh, at some point uh, and this will I think uh, will be an important um, information whether targeting mitochondria 
directly in, in cardiac diseases is promising. There also have been many other approaches and, and still are. So for instance, it has been observed in a clinical trial on 500 or a couple of hundred patients with heart failure that the, um, the randomization to coenzyme Q, which can, is an over-the-counter drug, has uh, surprisingly reduced mortality in these patients without grossly improving the functional status, but it improved uh, survival in these patients. And this is a, an interesting result that still needs to be verified by a larger uh, trial that uh, we hopefully are getting at some point also. But uh, for now, it has not found uh, um, the entrance into the current guidelines because it's considered that the, the trial so far was underpowered. It is also not quite clear whether coenzyme Q, if you give it like it is, uh, will find its way into the mitochondria because coenzyme Q is a component of the respiratory chain and it's, it, can, it accepts electrons and therefore can in a way scavenge reactive oxygen species as long as it is uh, recycled and regenerated. Um, but there are approaches to target coenzyme Q more specifically to mitochondria and this uh, compound is then called MitoQ, where coenzyme Q is coupled to uh, TP, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, TPP, which is uh, a molecule that due to its uh, positive charge is um, targeted to mitochondria. So this compound in turn has been tested broadly um, experimentally. It's been developed by Mike Murphy and colleagues in Cambridge and um, uh, there have been even some clinical trials with this compound, but not in cardiovascular diseases, in, but in, uh, I think, hepatitis. Um, and, but we don't have data in, in, in patients with heart failure or other cardiovascular diseases yet. Mm -hmm. okay. And maybe one last thing is that uh, iron therapy is already accepted in heart failure and it's in the guidelines and it's been proven to improve uh, symptoms but not mortality and uh, one idea is that uh, of course iron is important for many mitochondrial uh, processes involving the electron transport chain but also the Krebs cycle and it could be that through the iron therapy mitochondrial function is improved we have some uh, or there are some data on that but it's not completely clear how the drug works and it's also not clear if this is an effect that takes place in the heart or in the skeletal, skeletal muscle or both. Probably both, I would say. But mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, still not completely resolved yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mack. And thanks for watching this video.